Hello, everybody. My name is Nancy Cavanis, and I am here with Steve Bingham Hawk. Um, it is our pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Participant Management, Tools and Tips for Efficient Customer Service. Today's session is going to highlight our built-in participant management tools to make your life and the life of your partic participants a bit easier. We're gonna go ahead and get started here in just a few moments, but first I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes to keep everybody, everybody's webinar running smoothly. So for starters, you do have the ability to minimize or maximize the control panel um, in the upper left-hand corner. And as for questions, even though everyone that's in attendance today is going to be muted throughout the session, we do encourage you to submit questions if you have them using the question pane on the control panel. Uh, we will get to them as time allows, and as moderator, I will be following them. And if time, um, if we have time at the end, I will bring them up to Steve, and he'll probably gladly answer them. If your question doesn't get answered to, during today's session, somebody will follow up with you after the fact. In about 24 to 48 hours, a recording of this webinar will be shared with all registrants. So there's really no need to take notes or screenshots today if you just prefer to sit back and watch and listen. And so with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Steve Bingham Hawk, who is all set to present today's webinar. All right, well, thanks, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here with you today for those watching live, as well as anybody who's tuning in on demand, welcome. And yes, we're gonna talk about something that the whole idea of is to make everyone's life easier, as, as uh, Nancy mentioned earlier. And I think it also embodies a lot of the spirit of our platform and kind of how our business is built, really, which is the sort of self-serve model where our customers, yourselves, race directors, but also our registrants have control over their experience um, on our platform um, and have tools right at the finger, your fingertips, their fingertips, and, some, and, and a whole lot of transparency as well um, that just allows for really a better experience. Um, so we're gonna dive into these features that are all falling under this umbrella of participant management today. Um, we're gonna start with uh, sort of hitting home a message that will be throughout today, um, which is to save time with these features, especially um, as we're looking at the self-serve um, features and tools. And then what are the bulk tools that are available to you as a race director so that you can give really quick solutions to participants and really maximize and, 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 and increase the efficiency and effectiveness with your time. Um, we're gonna hit three areas specifically, deferrals, vouchers, and refunds. Um, and then talk about participant communications, because all of this is great, um, giving them you know, this power to control their, their registration experience and manage their registration, but um, there's an education element to it. And, and I think we, we set up a lot of resources to make that something that's very easy um, for you to, to get a hold of and, and make sure that it works for, for your audience, for your, your registrants. Um, so as we dive in, let's just look at from a 30,000 foot level, um, what are the goals in participant management? And for those that are new to run sign up and even newer to registration and races, so this idea of participant management is what are the pieces after somebody registers that they can use themselves um, with relative ease to make changes or to um, set themselves up for you know, a really great race day with modifications that might need to happen that race directors don't necessarily need to be a part of, or if they are, it's in a way that is behind the scenes and really um, and really easy um, and and to understand and to and to verify from the registration side. So first, the one the goal is that it's clear communication. Participants know where they stand at all times of their registration status, and then what options are available and what actions they need to take um, if they want to change something. Um, the second goal is whenever it's possible, we want to put the power into the hands of the registrant so that they are completing self-serve actions. Um, and then when it's possible, we want to be using bulk actions, especially when we're looking at larger populations to do things on the back end, like moving a whole group of people from one event to another, which we'll talk about more as we get in. And then reducing the burden on customer service. That's a great goal that everyone on this call as a customer, as a race director should be interested in. 
so that uh, you're maximizing your time and, um, and, and focusing your efforts where they really need to be. And then um, enhancing that participant experience. So what I mean by that is, you know, I'm sure there are folks out there that really are so uncomfortable with technology that a self-serve solution sounds nightmarish, right? And we all know those folks and, and, the, and they're, they're gonna be at every race, they're gonna be in every facet of life, right? And so we have tools for, for you to be able to help them. So turning on any sort of participant management feature does not mean that you're not able to do everything on your own if you'd like for them. But I think there's a better experience when people are able to do things right away. They can look at their options as they're moving through the flow of a change that's in their hands to make a decision what's best for them. They don't have to wait for somebody to get back to them. And that same experience that you get or that feeling when you send an email out to customer service world, right, the universe, hoping it comes back to you to help you as you're trying to transfer events or you're trying to update your, your address or something. Um, being able to do that in real time and then confirm it yourself by looking at your profile and your registration record, that feels really great. That's that same feeling. So you're you're sort of putting that those those good vibes, that positive energy of their experience. You know, first it was easy to register and get signed up, and now it's easy to make changes. So that that's part of the whole spirit, I think, of these tools. So when we're looking at what things people can can manage, and 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 um, is first of all those a lot of these settings, most of them are are set to default. Um, are, are by, excuse me, <laughs> their default to be set to off, meaning that you need to enable them. Okay, so that way you're not going to be surprised when somebody is able to do something you knew about that. Okay, so you're going to be able to choose one, a few, or maybe all things that you want people to the ability to to modify. And then some of the examples of things to sort of give, you know, um, specific uh, or illustrate kind of what, what this means in a tactical way, um, they can update their t-shirt size. If you are offering something like additional swag in your add-ons, if you're um, allowing people to transfer between different event distances within your race, updating their participant information, shipping, custom questions, and more, um, all of these things can be in the hands and in their power to make the changes on their own. And again, you as the race director have full control to make these same changes for them just by enabling participant management features it does not reduce your ability to do anything for your participants. We need that extra help. So let's talk about some of the, the things that you can um, enable for them to be able to manage on their own. So first of all, participant information. Um, and, uh, and I want to pause here just real quick, so just sort of a housekeeping thing. But if you look at the bottom of my slide right here, so what we do, we do this in most of our webinars, I think at this point is helping you with the path. So what I'm talking about here and where you're able to update these settings is always gonna be listed as a path in the dashboard of where you start. So from your back backend dashboard, look at the participant menu on the left-hand side below that participant management and then participant info, okay? So you'll see that throughout this presentation. Um, but here you see a screenshot of the different fields. So things change, people move, a phone number might change, maybe something was miskeyed and needs to be updated. So you can allow them to do that on their own. One thing that we might advise you towards, and I think most race directors are more comfortable with, is locking down the name. Because we don't want people going in and trying to change the name of their registration to maybe a family member or a friend if they decide not to participate. We have features called participant transfers if they want to move that registration to somebody else. And if you allow that to happen, if you're okay with that. Um, so my advice would always be to lock that down. Don't let people change those. Now, if somebody obviously has a life event, they get married, or for whatever reason their name changes, you can certainly help them with that on the back end, but that's not something that I would put in the hands of um, the participant. Now, event transfer is probably one of the most common participant management uh, features that are asked about and utilized. So if you're offering multiple events at your race, like a 5K, a half marathon, a full marathon, it's very likely that that full marathon that sounded great to sign up for in March doesn't feel the same way in September. So you want to give people the option to move um, down. It happens to go up sometimes, but I would say the majority is people moving down in distance. Um, and here you can see there's lots of features that you can configure, different settings. So you can charge a fee um, for this transfer or not. You can just keep it at the default at zero. You can put some parameters around the date so that there's a cutoff when they're allowed to transfer and not. And that can help, especially if you've got specific bibs and t-shirts or other swag that are specific to certain events, you may not wanna leave that open all the way. The other really nice piece is that you can configure what transfers are allowable and which ones are prohibited. 
So you're fine with somebody moving from a full to a half to a five, right? But what about somebody who signed up for a kid's K? You know, they're a minor. Are you going to let them transfer to a full marathon? Probably not. So you can lock down transfers as you wish. You can also differentiate most of these settings by event. So it doesn't have to be um, all or nothing. All events under one race get the same settings. Race transfers. So if you're managing multiple races, let's say you've got a spring event and a fall event, and you want to be able to offer the chance for somebody to bow out of the spring event and then start um, or, or to register for the fall one, this is a way to allow them to do that. And again, you can set a fee, you can set date parameters, you can also set a credible percentage, which allows so much value for them to be taken over from their original registration to the new one. Um, so this is very valuable for you know giving people lots of flexible options if for some reason they're not able to participate. And then participant transfers, which I was talking about earlier. So um, there are three ways that this can be done. First of all, it's the transfer for refund option. So this is where the original person will get a refund of what they paid, but only after the new person that they're transferring the registration to has registered and paid. The second way would be a gift transfer. So if you decided that whoever you know re registered originally and they satisfied the registration revenue in your mind and they want to give that to somebody else and not charge any fees or any differences in anything, then that can be zero dollars and the new person paid over that registration from the old one. The original person then is no longer active. The new person has an active registration status. Um, and then the other option is a customizable transfer fee. So you can charge a fee, um, you know, it could be something very common like $20, $25 to transfer to somebody else. And you can set it such that the original person has to pay that fee or the new person taking over the registration. Okay. Giveaway management, probably another really common one uh, in addition to the event transfer where people can update their t-shirt size. Obviously, fitness levels can change, especially as you're training, getting ready for a race. So if they need to update that, they can do that as well. Add-on management. So there's two levels to this one. First is those that did select an add-on, something like VIP parking or uh, you know a coffee mug, some kind of additional swag item. They can go in and choose um, a different option within the add-on that they already purchased. But this also applies to folks that decided not to add an add-on during the registration flow. They're able to go in and manage their registration from their profile and be able to then add on that, that additional upgraded parking location or that additional swag item. Um, and then they're immediately put into the purchase flow so that they pay with a credit card and everything still stays tied to that original registration. So that's great for you on the reporting side. It's great for the participant because they see everything. They can immediately look at what their add-ons are after the purchase um, transaction has finished. So again, there's that transparency and that instant satisfaction um, of, it, of, of what you had on your to-do list and it's already been done and you can verify that yourself in your profile. Another area would be questions. So the custom questions that you set up, those are often things like emergency contact information, could be something you know more marketing focused, like how did you hear about the event? Um, so if you want the ability for folks to go in and to update that, then I would turn this on. And I would, there's very few instances where I would say to lock this one down. Um, so, so I would put that at the top of the list to allow people to do. And then for those that have enabled groups and teams, so and in this case, I'm talking about our social groups and teams, uh, you can set it so they have the ability to maybe change their name, maybe change their group type. You can lock it down with um, parameters around the dates again of when they can do this and not do this, uh, and when they can, uh, when and if they can allow folks to, to set up a new group or team. So these uh, these are settings that apply to this this aspect. Um, and then corrals. So you may uh, want to allow folks to move between corrals that they have signed up for or been assigned to. Um, and you, you know, I, I want to highlight the fact that this does not overwrite anything that's in your corral settings. So if you've got capacity limits to certain waves, it's not going to, you know, suddenly allow them to move into a corral that's full, right? So it's going to respect those original settings. All right, so now we're going to jump into our bulk participant management tools. So these are things that are going to help your participants because you're going to be able to solve you know, problems or, or, or actions for them. But really, it's designed to make race directors' lives much easier. So the things that are included in our bulk tools under participant management, you can see in your dashboard where that's located, um, include refunds, registration deletions, transfers from race to race or event to event, deferrals, and 
deferral fee refund. So these are things that we have built out that are common, you know, that have become common questions and requests over, over the time or over time. And so um, these are available to you now. And then I wanted to show sort of the, an example of what it looks like when you're doing one of these bulk tools. So you can see it's really driven by the registration ID. Okay, and so there's several ways to get those registration IDs for a population that you're trying to apply some sort of bulk action to, like deleting or transferring them from one event to another. Um, and so one way is to download your participant report and you can work in an Excel to sort and filter however you need to until you're comfortable with the list that you've got. And then you're going to just copy those registration IDs and simply paste it in. Um, the notes here show um, that you can separate registration IDs by a space, a comma, or a tab, um, or a new line. So just by copying and pasting from Excel is going to create a new line for each registration ID. Another option is to use the quick fill option. So those are the orange uh, bars you see on the right-hand side. So if I want to just quickly bring over registration IDs from one of my events within the race, then I can hit one of those buttons and it'll automatically bring those over. So that's a nice feature. Obviously, though, it's going to be limited to you know, what event you're trying to bring over, and it's going to bring everyone without any sort of filtering. So if you've got a specific population that you're trying to do something for, you're going to want to, want to manipulate that somewhere else like Excel and then paste in your registration IDs on the left-hand side. So and this is, it works similarly, similarly or looks similar to this for those other bulk um, actions that I mentioned um, earlier. So now we're gonna, gonna dig in a little bit deeper with deferrals. And you know, this is probably because it is a complex um, action in that you know, you're, you're basically, you're moving, there's several things that have to happen. Somebody first has to say that they want to defer. And so we're not gonna dive all the way into that today because that's sort of outside of the original scope of this, but you know, they have to sort of indicate, yes, I'm going to defer my race. But then what happens after that, right? And you're moving data essentially because there's an original race registration and then they are indicating that they want to be in the next year. And then how do they get to be an active registrant in the following year? Okay. So first of all, for those people that have said they want to defer, um, they're going to be, you're, you're going to be able to see that in one of the reports. So that's in reports, not registered, deferred registrations. Right there at the top is showing you that path. And it's going to give you some of the information um, that you may need if you want to use one of these methods I'm going to talk about in a second to just automatically bring them over. Otherwise, I think it's just helpful to see you know, how many people did you have um, that deferred. And then how do we get them into uh, the following year's race or, or the current year if you've already renewed, right? So the first option is to import or transfer them into that, that new or current year. Or you can send everyone who deferred a coupon code to redeem for essentially a free registration or whatever value discount you want to apply to that coupon code. Uh, or you can use reserved entry links. We're going to talk about two different types. And then finally, the defer via race transfer tool, uh, which I think is a really slick way that makes um, the process really easy on both sides. So the import or transfer option, I think it's really attractive to some folks who say, all right, somebody has indicated that they want to defer and I just want to get them into next year's race without any additional action on their end. I want it to just be simple and done. And, and, that's, and that's the pro. <laughs> so it's easy for the participants, right? However, um, one of the cons is that it may increase your total operation costs. And the, re and, and the way it does that is our data is showing that 60% of registrants are not going to be redeeming or actually showing up on event day, those that have deferred. So, um, so you're, sorry, I may have said that wrong. So less than 60 are going to claim. So there's about 40% of people that are, are not going to be showing up. Uh, to the to the race. So that means that you're going to be planning, if you just bring them over, give them active registrations, you're going to be planning to feed that 40% of those deferrals. You're going to be getting shirts for them when you don't need to. And I realize you don't know who's going to come and who's not going to come, but that's why some of our other tools put the registrant in more of a, a proactive or rather than a passive um, stands where they have to claim their deferral. So that does not happen when you import or just transfer them right over. The other uh, disadvantage is a waiver um, is not being signed for the next year. So you would want to consult with your, your legal um, uh, counsel to see what that means for you. And that's, that's so nuanced and, you know, according to what 
kind of event you're putting on and what jurisdiction, what county, what state you're in. So you'd want to check with somebody, a professional on that. But on a waiver that was signed, you know, maybe 18 months before somebody actually participates and signed for a different year of registration may not hold up. So it's best to have them sign a waiver for the current year. And that's not possible when you're using this importer transfer option. The other uh, disadvantage is that it's outdated information. So again, if you have deferred, let's say you signed up 10 months before the race, close to race day, you end up deferring and then you don't do it till the next year. I mean, that could be 18, 20, 22 months in between when you originally registered and gave your information to when you're actually coming to the start line. A lot can happen during that time with address changes, marital statuses, um, giveaway shirt preferences, um, so you, that that doesn't this import transfer doesn't allow for that information to be updated. Now, of course, if you have your participant management tools turned on, they can always go into it. But then you're requiring them to again take an action to do that. Whereas if you're forcing them into a new registration flow with our other tools we're going to talk about, then you're going to capture that information. And I think that's best practice. Um, and then we've just got the the links down below or the excuse me the paths that show you how to get to those places if you're going to be do the import. Um, or transfer. And again, this presentation is going to be mailed out. These, these, uh, these, this deck of slides will be uh, sent to you after the uh, presentation is over. So the second method is the coupon code. So this is where you're going to create unique codes for all your folks that were deferred. So that's going to require a little bit of, of fun in Excel, creating these unique codes. You're going to need to import them, and then you're going to need to send these out to everyone. So basically, they'll just start a brand new registration once you've renewed your race from the previous year. And then when they get to the checkout screen, they'll put in their coupon code and then whatever value you've assigned, uh, whether it's 100% or some other discount, will be applied and, and then they're finished. And you can track those coupon codes to see who used what. Um, but it would be best practice, of course, to use unique codes for everyone. Um, so it can be a little time consuming, this process. And it also sort of disconnects the person from the original registration. So that original registration just stays in deferred status, it doesn't move to anything else. Um, and then you're looking at a you know a brand new registration that just has that coupon code. So there's there's a little 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 bit of break in in the uh, in the, the chain of uh, resources there. Uh, so the next option, third one is to use a reserved entry. We've got two different types. So you can use a single use entry. Um, and what that looks like is you're gonna take that list of deferred registrants. You're going to import them in because the system is going to want to create one URL per person. So everybody gets a unique URL. And as soon as you import those folks, it is going to send an email to them. So be cautious with this one. Take so much caution with this option because you want to make sure it's set to go. And the other piece of this is when you're putting in your settings and according to maybe what is the deadline, what, what are the date um, guardrails that um, somebody has to use and, and, and redeem using the reserved entry, um, as well as maybe special pricing that you, you put in, whether or not they can um, register outside the normal registration period that's available to the public. So if you import all of these and you create, say, 300 of them, if something was off, if you made a mistake, or maybe you didn't make a mistake and you just want to extend the period in which they can redeem it, you're going to have to go into every one of those 300 links to update it. So again, I say use this with probably smaller populations or use it so that, um, you know, or, or, or don't <laughs> be really careful when you're importing, just making sure that all the information is correct. Um, and then also note that this is not, these, these single um, unique URLs are not specific to a certain person or a user. So if that person doesn't use it, they could use that URL or copy that URL and send it to a friend or family member and then they can use it. So we're gonna to get to another option which locks this down more, um, which is still a reserved entry, but it's called our multiple use reserved entry and then pairing that with a loyalty list, okay? So the idea is you've got a list of people, your deferred folks, you only want them to be able to use this um, reserved entry link. And so you're gonna create a loyalty list from your deferred report, okay? And you're gonna create a multiple use reserved entry link. And what that means is it is like those single use ones, but it's not just one unique one per person. And a number of people can use it. And you can set the, the, the parameters around that in terms of how many uses it can get and, and the dates as well. Um, but when you tie that multiple use reserve entry link to a loyalty list, only those on the loyalty list can use it. Okay. 
And what it's checking for are, is the information that you upload on that loyalty list, which is first name, last name, and email address. And if somebody is logged in with their run profile, it's very likely that they, they are not gonna have trouble with that. But if somebody did have a name change or is using a different email address, it might not recognize them. So that's, that's something to always be aware of. Um, but this is a really great tool and, and not just for deferrals too. It's also really great for if you're wanting to open registration to a certain population, not necessarily deferred people, but maybe people that have registered in the last three years and allow them first crack at some special pricing or to get um, coveted spots that might sell out before you open it to the public. So consider that there's, there's, there's uses beyond our deferral conversation here. Um, keep in mind with our multiple use reserve entry, uh, there's not an automatic email, automatic email that's sent out because you're not necessarily uploading a, a list that is, is then generating notifications. You're tying it to a loyalty list, but there's no notification trigger there. So you will be using something like email marketing V2 uh, where you can send out all the instructions to folks and, and it's very easy for them because they'll, they'll simply just use that link and, and register over there. Um, the other nice uh, advantage to using this method is that it's easy to update that multi-use reserve entry. So if you did want to extend the period or you did make some kind of mistake with pricing, you can always go back and do that in a fairly easy way. All right, and now I think which you would, if you talk to an account manager, you'd probably get this solution presented to you first. <laughs> so we kind of built up to like maybe the least desirable way to do it to probably the, the best practice way to do it um, using our defer via race transfer tool. So this is gonna have to happen. No, I wanna say this from the beginning is that you need to make sure that you've renewed your race and that registration is open. So registration has to be open for people to be able to claim their, their deferrals using this defer via race transfer tool, okay? And then there's three ways that you can sort of offer um, people the ability to claim those deferrals. Um, and then there's some, some settings and, and fees and, and dates and things that are kind of, that kind of bookend both, all of these three options. So first one is use the amount that is paid for registration. So therefore, whatever, if they paid $50 in February and now it's a year later and they're going to claim their deferral, um, that's the money that is gonna be applied. So if the fee is now $60, they're gonna to have to pay the difference of $10, okay? The second option is that the new event is always going to be free. So if you feel, again, like they have satisfied their registration fees with you whenever they registered at whatever rate and you just wanna get them into the new event and then they can even move across to more expensive events, then allow this, this to happen. There's, there's no, you know, we're not worrying about credits, we're not worrying about fees. And then the third option, which is to set a creditable amount that's based on the previous event. So you can set such that if I deferred from the full marathon, maybe I'm gonna give you $150 because that's to, you know, the most expensive price that you might pay. And when that, that credit is used up at whatever time they're registering, so even if it's $120 um, and, they, and you're giving them up to $150, it's not gonna save $30 for them to use for something else. And they certainly wouldn't get that money back for free or anything. So don't be worried about that. But what you're trying to do or what you're aiming for when you're setting these credible, creditable amounts is that um, you're not forcing them into paying something in addition uh, to what they've already paid in the past, okay? Unless they're you know, gonna register at a time where the price does go up that creditable amount. And then and that way you're being very intentional about wanting to collect some sort of incremental revenue from them. Um, so the, the nice part of this is that when you do renew your race, okay, open registration, you set your defer via race transfer tools in the new renewed race, um, now, what's going to show, and what always showed when they originally made that decision to defer, it's going to show in the deferrals tab in their profile. Now, once I've turned on the defer via race transfer settings, complete deferral is now going to show up. So when I click on that, it's going to move me into the registration flow, and then whatever settings, whether I'm getting a creditable amount or it's just completely free, um, that will that will be reflected as I move through the flow and then get to check out. And that's where I can agree to the waiver again and choose my giveaway size and a new emergency contact information if I need to. Okay. And then we'll always have reporting available so that you can see who's claimed a deferral and which race they transferred into or which event they transferred into. Um, this is a super flexible way of doing deferrals and claiming them. Um, and it's, it's to some degree a set and get feature, but we're gonna get to participant communication here in our last section of the presentation, um, which then I would say, I 
I put an asterisk or walk that back a little bit. So it's not completely seven yet because you need to remind folks um, about taking that additional final step. Um, and then we've, we've covered this last bullet point about registration needing to be open. All right, another sort of um, bucket of tools, if you will, that uh, are, are within this idea of participant management are vouchers. And vouchers is a way to give somebody an amount of money. Think of it almost as like a gift certificate or like a credit you might have at a store that's tied to your, you know, your loyalty account with them, right? Um, and and what's, what the use cases for this are, are, are multiple. Maybe you're trying to give some sort of make good to a participant, um, either to um, you know, apologize for maybe something that happened one year and, and you want, want them to just feel like they're getting some love. But it can also be, um, you know, to a VIP uh, person that's part of a, a sponsor group. Um, but another big use is with volunteers. So we've seen a lot of people enact successful um, rewards programs with volunteers that are showing up for multiple shifts or doing multiple years um, and or just go above and beyond. And so you could give them voucher credit that's available to be used across potentially multiple races. And that voucher stays in their run sign up account and it's automatically uh, recognized when they're going through a race, registering for a race that that voucher pool is applied to or that voucher is applied to. So pretty cool feature, probably a little underutilized on our platform. So I'm glad we're talking about it today. Um, but wanted to cover this first concept of a, of a pool. So you can create different groupings of vouchers. Maybe it's by, um, by year, maybe it's by, um, uh, you know, a certain population of, of people that you're wanting to take care of and you just want to, you know, group those together so it doesn't get too crazy for you to manage and report on, right? Um, so you can create that voucher pool and you can um, share that voucher pool across races where you are a race director. And you do have some settings where you can allow current race directors um, that are connected with that voucher pool to be able to use them um, and apply them for that race. Or you can say, no, this is only you know, for me, so that they can't add other races that they're part of, you know, that are under their race director um, account with uh, Run Sign Up. So, and there's different ways to add a voucher. You can add them just as an individually, just kind of one-offs. Um, you can also add them in full by importing the CSV file. Um, and then you have the ability to look at reports to see what voucher um, has been viewed and what's been clicked on. Um, the nice thing about voucher that's different than a coupon code, different from credit that comes over from a deferral is that it um, stays with them. So if they only use $30 to sign up for a 5K, but their voucher was for $50, they would keep $20 still in their profile. Now, again, they can only use that $20 towards a race that is applied with that or connected with that voucher. Um, and, and don't worry though, they're never gonna get any sort of a refund. You know? So that's something that you might wanna think about in your communications and how you present this to your participants to make sure that that's very clear. I mean, most people get that, um, but it's just something that, that could come up in you know your communications with folks. And then wanted to also cover this topic of refunds. Um, so you know, because I think this this falls under our participant management section, and it's something that's pretty common. You know, that race directors have to deal with. So I just want to give some reminders, um, tips, and tricks. So first of all refund reserve you have to have money in there to, in order to be able to issue refunds okay and that that amount is usually set on features that you've turned on so if you have referral refunds uh, uh, enabled then we're going to hold back some money to make sure that that's available for anybody that might reach a level where they deserve to get a refund um, otherwise though refunds are going to draw from any funds that are not satisfied or not um, you know completed um, before the money is is taken or is is uh, moved into your bank account from run sign up. So so most most everyone is on a weekly direct deposit payment on our platform. So as the week is going on, you know you might want to think about probably that Monday or Tuesday period when we sort of cut that off and then put the money in your bank account. That's probably not the best time to do a bulk um, refund action, right? Because if you do. Um, the funds may not be available, right? Because they've been paid to your bank account. Once they leave us, it's with you. Um, so now, of course, you can wait for that money to build up again over the next few days and then use those additional funds to pay the refund out through Run Sign Up. Um, but with those bulk refunds, you can do up to a thousand at a time. You can do them by one offs. There's a zero dollar refund fee. So we're not charging you the race director and the person is not being charged a, a refund fee from run sign up. 
One thing to remember though is with refunds is that you can't um, refund anything over the year. And that can come into play with deferrals, right? Because so, you might be participating 18, 20 months after you originally registered. And so if that deferral person wants the refund and you grant that for them, um, just, just be aware of that, okay? And then you can always set a refund policy um, where uh, they, it's just going to, well, first of all, you can put in custom text that explains what your refund policy is. It can be featured as just sort of display only, telling them what it is, or you can, in the registration flow, force them to agree to it, you know, with a checkbox or an initial um, agreement. All right, so now we're gonna hit participant communications. So the biggest takeaway, I think, from this, other than to enable these features, right, um, is that you have a way of educating folks, and the best way is to have an FAQ, okay? So the way you do this is you wanna create a page sign up website that explains, you know, what is available to folks, what can they manage on their own, and how do they do it? So when you do this, you're gonna make sure that you make a list of all the questions that you expect the most. And I would prioritize those to make sure the ones that you're getting most frequently or expect to get most frequently are up towards the top. Um, and then you want this to be a living, breathing um, document or, or page, if you will, on your website, because people are going to be asking questions about this and that. And it may simply be also that your, your, your answer to one of these questions is that that's not possible. You can't manage that on your own and I need to do it. And maybe you wanna add that to your FAQ. Um, but with this FAQ page, you don't have to build this from scratch. We have so many resources where we have built um, articles, we've made videos that explain to participants how they can use these participant management features on their own. So you can just literally make a list of questions and hyperlink each question to the article on Run Sign Up that explains how to do it and literally walks them through screen by screen. Okay. Now, the other option too, though, is that you can customize it. So take all of our articles, all of our resources, and then customize those with your own branding, the name of your race, maybe links, you know, to your particular race website, and, and give it that extra, you know, sort of, you know, white label feel. Um, not always necessary, because I think that our tutorials, they've been around for so long, and they keep getting finessed and enhanced and reworked so that they speak, you know, sort of race agnostically, if you will, um, where it, it applies to everyone, because it's the same process, regardless of what race is on our platform. Um, and so then, so feature this FAQ page on your Run Sign Up Race website. We recommend you go to the custom sections um, portion of the race website, and um, then you can use your custom content display to tell the race website how it's going to be displayed and featured. So do you want that to be a top menu item or do you want it nested within some other um, item or just a header? Um, and then the menu order can tell you where, or you can tell it where to appear on the website um, from you know, once it's part of that menu header. And I often recommend that you slide that all the way over to the right so it really stands out, the eye goes to it um, right under that sign up button, okay? And then um, you're gonna wanna call out this page in other places on your website. Um, so ways you can do that, if you're doing a custom and you're not using cover pages or our, our, our website B2, a newer tool that really makes for just such dynamic websites, adding so much more content um, that's available and, and really get that professional and polished look to it. Um, if you're not using one of those, you can, it will just appear um, as a custom section on that race info page. Otherwise, you might want to add a content block on your cover page or website B2 content that has a button taking you directly to that FAQ page, okay? And then where, just want to call out, where are users typically looking for help? You know, if this is something that's helpful to you. So again, you can see in this screenshot, the FAQs is all the way over to the right, because I think the eye draws right over there. But a top level menu item is, is really best. Um, people are also going to be looking for a contact us form or how to get in touch with people. And this is up to you what works best for your race and how you want to, you know, that information out to them. You have options within your race, whether you want to use a contact form or show an email address. Um, but one, one tip I offer is, you know, if you're putting all these participant management features in play, I would recommend that you have all those question for, questions first on your FAQ page and then put the way for people to get in touch with you towards the bottom, like let them go through that process looking for their answer and then give them an option to reach out as opposed to starting because they may just completely bypass any of these beautiful resources you've put together for them, um, which give them all this control and, and immediate satisfaction. Um, and they'll just email you directly. <laughs> so so just, just one tip, do what's best for you, of course. Um, and then always keep it simple. 
um, keep it up to date. Don't bog it down with too much information and nuances, exceptions and asterisks and double asterisks. You know, because when people see that and it feels like much work, then again, they're gonna bypass all of that, not do what you want them to do and go straight to you and email and ask for help. So, um, and then you can also use drop downs if you want to sort of um, differentiate a, a grouping of FAQ. So in this case, we're mentioning hybrid races if you've got a virtual option, but you could also, um, if you wanted to have a page that is specific to registration FAQs, and then a page that is for sort of race day information like parking, um, that's not really related to the things that they're doing on, on run sign up. And then this is just showing you here what the, um, the website help.runsignup.com looks like. Um, you know, you can search here also just Googling what you're looking for, like how do I redeem a coupon, you know, and, and then use the word run sign up right after that. Usually that'll take you to the top hit that's going to explain to a participant how do they use their coupon. Um, and then uh, on every page that you're in our dashboard on and you're setting up different features, look for that orange help button because most of the time, if not all the time, it's going to take you to an article that is specific to that feature that you're looking to configure um, right there and then. So you're not having to search around, it's, it's just taking you right to the solution. And then here is an example of uh, an FAQ page where you can see they've actually nested it under their general registration info that says registration FAQs. They've got their questions on the left there that are hyperlinked to, and they're not, they're not white labeling this, they're not, they're not customizing this or making this branded for their race. It's just going directly to an article or a resource on the run sign up website to help them um, get the answer they need. And then this is also highlighting just how you want to build that page out. You saw on that last page that they, they just had a list of and everything was hyperlinked. In this case, they're using some more coloring and they're giving some additional sort of um, prompt text to sort of explain the answer before you're actually going to click on that and go to the more detailed answer. And then what I sort of referenced to earlier is I want to make sure that this isn't necessarily a set and forget piece when you're doing you know, these sort of automated deferrals using the defer via race transfer or these other participant management features like changing you know, between events, you wanna make sure that you are communicating this to folks, okay? And so when all of your communications are going out, you're talking about sponsors, all the fun things you're doing, thanking volunteers, put that FAQ link at the bottom of each email. Give everybody the opportunity to get the answers that they need. And again, take that burden off of your support team. Um, and then as a reminder, if you're not already doing this, it's so helpful to put together an athlete guide, which gives all the information anybody could ever want, just the 411 on everything. I recommend that you try and get it produced and sent out two to three weeks out before, and then send it again on Monday, because even 80% probably won't read it the two to three weeks out, but at least you're gonna capture some. Everyone's opening up on Monday, okay? And that's a great opportunity, and in my opinion, to put sort of your top five questions that you've been getting with the responses and links to it, in the body of that email using email marketing v2 but then link out to the bigger faq page okay so you again constant communication making sure it's in their hands um, so that you're sort of teaching them how you want them to interact and engage with you um, in your race so and with that um, i think that covers what we're we're, we're going over today so i want to um, honor any questions maybe that uh, came up during the presentation, Nancy, if you wanted to bring anything to the group. We've had some great questions, Steve. Um, a couple I've not been able to get to yet, so hopefully you can you can get to them. So we've had a couple of questions asking about the use of coupons and the use of vouchers and processing fees. So questions like, if I use a coupon, what happens with processing fees? If I use a voucher, what happens with processing fees? Um, kind of like what it's gonna look like when they get to that checkout spot, if they're sure. utilizing those tools. Right, so our processing fees are always gonna be applied to whatever the amount is in the transaction that's about to happen. So if I'm using a $25 coupon, on a $30 registration fee, it's gonna take me down to that $5 that I'm now gonna to need to pay. And then the processing fee is applied to that $5 that I'm gonna now you know, actually process. So not necessarily, not on the, the full amount, but on the amount that I'm actually having to pay in that moment. And then that, that same thing would, that same concept would apply for vouchers. 
Great. And then a couple of other questions we've had are asking about our notifications and why they get sent out and how they get sent out and if race directors can customize the information that goes out to their registrants, sort of make their life easier once they've signed up. Absolutely. So um, that's a great, I'm glad you, that was brought up because uh, the most important, I think, notification on the platform is the one called user registered. And so that's under your, it'll be under race and then notifications and then general settings. And you'll see a list of all the notifications that are triggered when something happens on our platform, when a transaction processes. So if the donation goes out, that's where the email that you can customize that goes to the person who donated, that's where that lives. When anybody registers, that's the user registered one. If a donation is made to a fundraiser, the fundraiser is notified. And you can go into each one of these um, just by clicking on the hyperlink of the name of the notification on that page and customize it. And you're given an opportunity, it'll have a list of available placeholders where you can enter in information that is driven or populated by whatever happens in the transaction. For example, with a donation, like the, the name of the donor, right? Um, and then you can also put in static text. So for the user registered one, it's gonna give them the details about their, you know, their transaction, like how much they paid, what did they register for, um, but then you can include static text to say something to the effect of don't forget parking has changed this year and then point them to you know, a link on Google Maps that tells them where that parking lot is. But here, and this is why I'm glad it was brought up, would be a great opportunity um, to put in if you have any questions, please visit our FAQ page and then put the URL of that run sign up race website page in that confirmation email so that people are getting that and able to get their answers because i think that's an email that people constantly refer back to when they're double checking like wait what what race or what's the date of that race i signed up for or or what event am i doing again <laughs> um or if they surrender up multiple people who did i register again so um i think that's that's a really helpful point is to include that faq link in a notification that's great. And Steve, this was a good one too. So um, race director had asked about adding a registrant on the back end using our import tools, but they said, what happens to their mm -hmm. waiver? <laughs> they haven't signed the waiver. So I mm -hmm. that you might want to mention the ability, if people have the ability yep. to sign the waiver. That's that's a great point. Um, so there is a way that to have a status, if you will, for waivers, whether it was signed or not. Um, so if they don't have a, a signed waiver status, then there's reports that can get triggered for that. Um, and then you can send out a notification to them with a replacement tag that takes them to a place where they can sign that waiver. There's also an opportunity on our uh, race day check-in app when people are coming to pack a pickup where they can even use their finger to swipe and, and agree to the waiver um, right there in person on the volunteer or staff member's mobile device that they're using to check them in. But again, I, I think this is an opportunity to highlight, you know, the, the importance of um, whenever possible, you know, putting things in the hands of the participants so that they are the one that's agreeing to that waiver at the time of the registration, which the tools such as um, you know, the defer via race transfer or the reserve entry links or even coupons allow, you know, for that waiver to be signed as well as addition, you know, the, their information to be updated um, and, and given for that new race registration for the new year. That's terrific, Steve. Thank you. Um, the only other question that I, uh, there's some other similar questions that are rolling in. But we've had a kudos about the Apple Wallet. <laughs> so you mm. might want to. Um, oh, fan, fans think, of the think Apple about Wallet. Because sure. wallet, that is definitely making people's life easier out on the other <laughs> end, too. <laughs> yes, I love that. And we have, and as a reminder, um, within email marketing V2, when you're sending out uh uh you know that athlete guide there's a lot of replacement tags that you can put in such as what event did they register for uh what t-shirt size did they sign up for what corral are they in but also um the link to help them 
added to their Apple wallet is also a replacement tag, as well as a QR code that you can put in that confirmation email so that when it's top of mind, when they get to the packet pickup location, it's right there and they can show it to the volunteer for a quick scan in and just makes the process of checking in so much easier and faster. Sounds great. I think we've just about covered all of the questions. Wonderful. Well, with that, I thank everybody for your time. Um, and hope, hopefully you learned some things. If you want to know more, feel free to, to reach out to us. You can always reach out to your account manager or our info at runsignup.com team. Again, um, within 24 to 48 hours, we'll send out the uh, slides to uh, uh, this deck, as well as the video recording, and that goes out to everybody who registered, not just folks that are in attendance, so that way folks will get it, and then that's why if you're watching it on demand, you're watching it now. Um, yeah, but I hope you all learned something, and uh, we'll be seeing you on the next one. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone.